it's the Sonic Psycho. History repeats itself. Sonic Frontiers is just another bad Sonic game. Or is it? Spoilers. I had fun with this one. It's Sonic Frontiers on every modern console, even the Nintendo Switch. So what's the story here? Well, Eggman reaches a place called Starfall Islands, tries to download knowledge of a very advanced ancient civilization using a new AI. This triggers whatever system controls the technology in the island to defend itself and he ends up being sucked into the so-called cyberspace. Meanwhile, Sonic, Amy and Tails are flying to the same islands to find out why the Chaos Emerald ended up being attracted to the location. Suddenly, a wormhole sucks them into the cyberspace and only Sonic manages to get out. Now, he needs to find out how to save everyone. Thankfully, a disembodied voice tells him what he needs to do. From here on, the game becomes a lot more open. Your goals to progress are always the same, but you're given the freedom to explore the huge island and use your collectibles to talk to your friends or with the mysterious AI Sage for more cutscenes and dialogue. This game just came out, I'm not going to spoil the details. The story itself is, well, good. It works. It connects to past games in ways you don't expect at first, but it also felt self-contained enough to where the game takes place that it never got ridiculous, at least not any more than the average Sonic game. The English script was made by Ian Flynn, creative force behind the still going Sonic comic book series, and is chock filled with direct references to past games. This seems to be uh, exclusive to the English script, because even with my mere N5 Japanese proficiency, I could tell almost none of those references were ever brought up in the Japanese voice lines. Speaking of, yes, I play this game with Japanese voices as I always do when it comes to Sonic games. Junichi Kanemaru will always be the definitive voice of Sonic to me. The English performances are not necessarily worse from the little I heard. Knuckles and Big the Cat definitely sound way better in English. I think the strong points for the story other than offering a less comedic plot is how it throws you into this mysterious island, doesn't tell you upfront what this is all about and asks you to keep following the breadcrumbs as the truth behind the ancient civilization reveals itself. The final reviews aren't going to keep you on the edge of your seat, but if you care about Sonic lore at least a little, you will be intrigued enough. It definitely expands the series universe in an interesting way. If you haven't experienced Sonic games before Sonic Colors, the darker, more serious tone of Frontiers might seem strange. Older Sonic fans will probably be more pleased than not. That said, the narrative and presentation have a few problems. Way too many of the cutscenes have a very sterile presentation, with two of three characters just talking and talking without much else going on. Some look almost like Sonic giving free therapy sessions. They do help giving you development and personality of each character, but they could have done wonders with the characterization if we saw Tails, Amy or Knuckles actually express more than just words. The loop of the story progression is insanely repetitive, comprising of just going to where the character is talking to them, then going after them again and talking again. This JRPG style pacing felt bizarre and out of place.
The gameplay is split into two components, the so-called open zones and the cyberspace levels. The cyberspace are designed exactly like how you would expect of games like Sonic Generations, Forces or Unleashed. The roller coaster rides to the goal with the hidden star rings and a few challenges for you to complete like achieving S ranks or finishing with a minimum amount of rings. I didn't find them difficult, but I've played other boost games before. The cyberspace levels are very hit or miss. Most are super short, beaten under a minute. The interesting part is that they seem to use nearly identical layouts as that of past 3D Sonic game levels. I definitely recognize a few Sonic Generations creations since the models and textures look pretty much identical to that game. For other creations I can't quite put my finger in it. At least for Sonic Adventure 2, stages have their layouts recognizable as well, which was a nice surprise. However, I found the cyberspace to be the weakest part of the gameplay. Having played Unleashed and Generations recently, I can tell Sonic doesn't feel anywhere near as good to control here. I don't know what happened. The physics are not quite the same, at times he feels quite a lot less responsive, and for some reason, the game is prone to canceling your boost so often you actually clear your levels faster if you mash the boost button instead of holding it when going in straight lines or riding grind rails. My other complaint is what the cyberspace levels look like. The intentional unfinished glitchy backgrounds don't look as all inspiring as the original generation zones and I wouldn't be surprised if Sonic Team added these cyberspaces in the last month or two of the development cycle. Because why else would they look like quickly put together Rome hack style modifications of the exact same four zones? All levels use assets from Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Sky Sanctuary, and I guess Cityscape would be the closest to what the city theme comes from. It's very jarring to see a section from Dragon Road using Sky Sanctuary models or the dense forest scenery of Green Forest being replaced by empty blandness of Green Hill. Now I'm sure someone will tell me that's 4 zones for 4 characters' memories, but tell me, how is Green Hill tied to Amy Rose? I'm 100% convinced the ripping of Generations assets was a cost and time cutting measure, nothing more. Still, like I said before, they were hit or miss and when they hit, it felt great. I just wish there were far fewer misses and that they didn't look so lazy. The open zones don't look amazing, in fact, the Sega hired these men jokes are on point. The Breath of the Wild looking ruins and towers have a plot significance, however that doesn't detract from how bland the islands look. If you remove Sonic from the equation, those would fit in just about any hyper-realistic game. But worst of all, there is nothing from gameplay experience standpoint that makes one island different from another. In a typical Sonic game, every zone has a distinct design foundation of the core principles of Sonic level design. For example, Angel Island has its waterfall climb and hollow three paths. Sky Sanctuary has its temples, steep slopes and spinners, etc. The only difference between each of the Starfall Islands is in the aesthetic and the titans you face. Another big issue with the design of the open zone is how disjointed and disconnected the organic and inorganic parts are. In hindsight, the grind rails were better integrated into the design back in Adventure 2 and Heroes, but have since then been very haphazardly placed. They look even worse here, since the countless Sonic Jungle Gems, which look literally the same no matter which island, have basically no harmony with the islands themselves. It's like someone designed the maps with an exploration open world game in mind, then Sonic Team borrowed it and sprinkled a bunch of springs, grind rails, and steel clad geometric shapes over it, like chocolate chips over a sundae. Of course, chocolate chips harmonize with ice cream, so maybe that was a bad analogy. The samey looking jungle gyms really emphasize the often brought up tech demo comments that critics make of Frontiers. This doesn't mean you can't have fun with it. It feels almost like they made an entire game out of a uh, ukulele skill toy box demo showcasing what can be done with Sonic in a huge spacious level. The thing is, it's still fun to play around with it. Though the physics are still somewhat scripted, so don't expect Sonic Adventure level of bouncing around. In fact, 
This is another complaint I have with the jungle gyms. I'd say at least half of them have fixed cameras affecting your controls, which goes against the freedom teased by the open zones. Some will even force you into two dimensions. Sonic can have his defense, attack power, speed and max screen cap increased by talking to these bearded Coco creatures who stand at multiple different locations of each island. Your defense and power require you to collect these heart and fruit shaped glowing seeds you get defeating enemies, breaking crates or completing challenges. Your speed and ring counter however require you to track down and deliver small Coco that can be found everywhere. They're usually standing around in areas you're going to end up passing through sooner or later, but they come with no real indication outside the noise they make when they're very close by. Thankfully, you can pretty much buy all the coke you need for fishing tokens. Yes, that means Big the Cat has been kidnapping thousands of the lost coco just so he can get more of your fishing tokens. You should have seen his criminal tendencies coming when that poor frog kept trying to escape from him in Sonic Adventure. In my playthrough, I only maxed my ring capacity when I was about to finish the game. There really isn't any point in not putting all you can into speed. After all, you can use your side loop ability to continuously run in small circles over and over to restore your ring energy to the max. More speed makes traversing the road faster and definitely more thrilling. And that's the great thing about the open zone's terrain. It looks very generic, but for the first time since Sonic went 3D, you were given the space to go fast in any direction for a relatively long time instead of being limited to short lasting scripted hallways. By far, the feature that benefited the most from Sonic Frontier's experimentation was the combat. Sonic can use a variety of moves he learns by spending skill points. The concept and execution is nothing unique, this has been a thing in action games since the Xbox 60 years. It's how fitting the moves you unlock are to a character like Sonic that makes their implementation so good. There are moves that will be effective no matter the enemy. But as you get closer to the last stretch of the story, enemies begin to punish you for not approaching combat with more strategy than just spamming your homing attack and basic combos. This makes fights last quite a bit longer than you expect in a Sonic game, but I never felt bored by it like I did in past games. They don't drag like in Sonic Boom and they are not janky like in Heroes. I had problems with a bad sense of depth making hitboxes hard to judge sometimes. But overall, the combat is one of the most polished features I've seen in 3D Sonic since ever, actually. Bosses have unique mechanics you need to deal with before they become vulnerable to attacks. Those mechanics are nothing unusual for Sonic games, so it works very well. They're all intuitive and offer just the right amount of challenge. Just like every other feature in the game, there is a problem with the combat implementation as well, a few of them. At some point the rewards for fighting enemies become redundant, and when you're just trying to go from point A to B, it gets very annoying, accidentally triggering an encounter, having to see the game pan the camera and show the enemy's name again, lock you out of accessing the map, and even worse, there is an enemy type in the last island that you literally cannot ignore without spending a good 20 seconds dealing with the initial mechanic. My other complaint are the supersonic fights. Those are mandatory story battles against the titans of each island. They look great and are accompanied by one of the few tracks I enjoy. The visual spectacle is pretty amazing. However, they're by far the most shallow experience you can have with combat in Frontiers. Pretty much every titan fight is dealt with in the same way except the very last one. Parry their attack, counter with one button combos, or two button specials, continue with one button combos, watch their new phase, parry their attack, counter with one button combos or your two button special, continue with one button combos, freeze and repeat. 
They barely break the repetition with scripted instant death QTEs. If you happen to miss the QTE and die, well, you have to start everything over all the way from having to climb the Titan again. And in some of these fights, the camera jam can be pretty aggravating. I didn't care for these fights. This style of boss design was trendy in the later 2000s. We're almost two decades past that. People always say the most consistent thing about Sonic is that the games have good music. That's usually true. Now, I can't really say that Forces of Frontier have bad music, but what I'm gonna tell you, and some might disagree with me, is that the music in both those games sounds like soulless, trend-chasing poppy music. Sonic music always had a distinct identity to it, even when tracks were not composed by Jun Senoe. Like, you could pick a random song from the games and you would be hard-pressed to associate them with anything but the game they come from. Not so much with the direction Otani has taken since Forces. There are some good tracks, I just think most of them sound like they could be a generic YouTube outro available for $10 licensing for your Fortnite gameplay videos. I was put off hearing those uninspired tracks not adding anything to the look or atmosphere of the cyberspace levels they play on. You could replace one for any other and absolutely nothing would be lost or gained. So what I'm saying is, I didn't care for Sonic Forces soundtrack outside of a handful of songs and that's still the case with Frontiers which follows nearly the same direction outside of the exciting open zone piano music. And again, I know this will anger some people but hey, reviews are by nature subjective. I'm here as a freaking banger though. This came out as a pretty negative review despite my initial comments, so I apologize for that. I really don't like making so much negative criticism like this, but I like being dishonest even less. I stand by that Frontiers is not a bad game. I had fun enough that I was able to complete every one of the 40 achievements in the game. It feels like a giant tech demo, true, but it was a tech demo that is fun to play with once. Be warned your millage will vary, your enjoyment of the game is heavily reliant on how much you enjoy the combat, the tone of the story and finding all the hidden challenges for completing the maps. If those three things don't seem engaging to you, I simply can't recommend the game. If that sounds like something you would enjoy, I still recommend not paying full price. The game took me 31 hours to complete 100% and that is with a lot of goofing around on making progress, dying because of camera jank or inconsistent while running controls, and wasting time trying to collect every memory token marking the map before I realized there was no achievement for that. It's a short game and as fun as it was to play around with all this promising potential for the future of the franchise, what is offered here is really a one-time thrill that I don't feel like ever replaying. Now which version you get, in my personal opinion, doesn't matter. I hear a lot of people criticizing the Switch version, but having played on the Series X, the game doesn't look any better than the good-looking Switch exclusives anyway, and the popping will be bad regardless. This is not a game you should buy for the graphics. It's a matter of how much you care for 60 frames per second at 1080p versus 30 frames at dynamic resolution. Get it whenever you can fight it for no more than $40.